to Bayesian statistics. Prior information for the uh, Poisson experiment, gamma distribution. All right, so we've been playing around with this idea of counts over time, and we've came up with this Poisson random variable that has the following distribution function. And remember, it's counts over time, so it can only take the values 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. What we're interested in is this parameter lambda here. And lambda is the average or the mean rate per time space unit. And it can only be positive. And what we want to do is try to come up with prior distribution for it because it's also our mean and our variance for this distribution. What do we know about lambda? Do we know anything? Yeah, we do know a few things. Number one, we know lambda is continuous, meaning that it can take values like 2.5 or whatever because it's an average, right? It's a balance point. It's not necessarily an observed point. Uh, number two, lambda has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's from the last slide. We know that. And really, lambda is not likely to be extremely large. And when I think extremely large, I think in the billions and billions, okay? Could it be that big? Yeah, but usually when we're thinking about this, if we're thinking about counting things, usually the numbers don't get hopefully that big, uh, unless we're doing like combinatorics where that's exactly the point is to come up with some really big numbers. All right, so if we had something that looked like this, this might be a nice way to incorporate some prior information because that's really what we're trying to do is incorporate prior information. Notice that large values for the parameter, uh, the average rate would be low and near zero, it would be low as well, possibly. This could be a, a reasonable, but it is on uh, all positive numbers, so we don't have to worry about any negatives being involved or anything like that. So this seems to be a reasonable approach here. Okay, so what distribution might work? Well, one popular distribution that has these properties is the gamma distribution, which has the probability density function that's given by this here. And it has two parameters, alpha and beta. Uh, and again, it's kind of like, wait a minute, didn't the beta distribution have two parameters, alpha and beta? Yes, it did. But uh, these are the ones we're putting in this one. Uh, they're different parameters and they work differently. Um, but if you stare at this, you'll see that there is a gamma function down in here which is related to the gamma distribution. Uh, X can only go from zero to infinity. Alpha has to be greater than zero and beta has to be greater than zero. Uh, has the following properties which come in really, really, really handy. So alpha over beta is the mean, okay? And you'll see it's come in handy here in just a little bit. Uh, and sigma squared is alpha over beta squared. So it's pretty easy to get at as well. Um, if you were trying to specify a mean and a variance and you wanted to use the method of moments technique to try to come up with these values because you had some estimates of a mean and a variance, this is how you would do that in order to set your alpha and beta in this case. Okay, so here's some examples. So here's a uh, gamma one. Uh, fifth here so gamma one one fifth and you notice here it goes from at zero it's quite likely has high likelihood and as it goes down uh, as x increases so this is one form of it and this is also known as the exponential distribution which will be coming up soon in another video because it models something else well um, here as soon as i make gamma the alpha equal to two notice it pins it down at zero and again, the mean here is five, uh, if you use the alpha over beta rule, um, and it trails off again. Um, here, uh, this one is uh, incorrect here, but uh, notice that this comes up and goes down, but it's always on positive support and it's right skewed and it will probably do what we want. Now, one interesting thing about this distribution is that if you let alpha run off to infinity, you'll get really, really close and beta go to zero, I believe. Uh, you get a normal distribution. Uh, but this looks approximately normal as it is. So, you know, you don't need it to be that big. All right, so let's look at... Um, a, an example. So, uh, Bayarma is interested in looking at the rate of connection failures to a local area network per hour. She thinks these rates follow a gamma distribution with alpha equal to 210 and beta equal to 100. 
Okay, so we can use R to help us calculate the probabilities associated with the distribution for this. And in R, we have uh, D gamma for the density, Q gamma for the inverse CDF, P gamma for the CDF, R gamma uh, will give us random numbers. And all I need to know is alpha and beta and bingo, this thing will work. Um, so here, now she's changed her mind and changed beta to 10. So uh, in this case, the mean would be around 21. She wonders, what's the probability that the rate is higher than 30? So what do I know? I know that this is what she's interested in. And here, if I do this, this is the opposite of my CDF. My CDF is less than, okay? So I would trace this to 1 minus probability x is less than or equal to 30. Alpha is 210, beta is 10. I'm just putting the parameters here so it's obvious what we're looking at. Uh, so this becomes 1 minus p gamma, 30, 210, and 10. And you can see this probability is really small, okay? It's 1.72 e or times 10 to the negative 8 uh, which if you wanted to see what it looked like written down this is what it would look like so if the distribution is correct then it's very unlikely that this rate is larger than 30. right let's uh leads to the question at what rate would the have a probability of being 0.95 or less okay uh so we want it to have a probability of 0.95 and we want to find the value that's associated with that so that we know any value less than the particular value we found is uh reasonable all right so what we can do use is the q gamma function put in 0 0.95 210 10 and we end up with 23.4391 so uh this gives us a good idea what an upper bound might be for the rate uh, okay, so here we've talked about the gamma distribution really quick. Um, we're going to be use this as the prior distribution for the Poisson experiment. Uh, just that was our motivation, and that's what we're trying to do with this. Uh, turns out the gamma distribution will pop up all over the place as we move through the course here. So you might as well get a little uh, familiarity with it and handle on it so that everything will be easier. Now, in the next video, we're going to uh, actually try to combine these two together to end up with the posterior distribution, which, uh, as a spoiler, ends up being a gamma distribution. But we'll see you there.